thing there. There we go. Um, so welcome everyone. It's, it's good to have you here. Um, my name is Eli Storch and I'm the chair of the Design Advocacy Group. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us for our January 2021 monthly meeting on preservation in the public realm. Um, so the way this morning will work is we'll, we'll do some quick announcements, uh, a couple uh, advocacy updates, and then we'll, we'll get to our speaker. Um, so just a few quick reminders, uh, please keep yourself muted uh, while, you're, while you're in here, just make it easier for everyone to hear. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, uh, Claire Adler and David Brownlee are on here and, and myself will do our best to assist you um, when we can. So with that, um, I just want to let people know uh, that typically uh, DAG's meetings have been off the record, but um, given our ability to share me, uh, share these meetings with a, a larger platform, we've made the choice to record them and, and share them on our website. So with that, you can always go back and, and take a look at our, our recent meetings, including uh, recently sworn in State Senator Nikhil Saval's recent talk on modern housing in Philadelphia, Lex Powers' presentation on the SEPTA Rail Transit Wayfinding Modernization Master Plan, um, as well as our evening panel uh, on uh, preservation entitled uh, whose history is it, the democratization of preservation. So as we talk through our announcements, if you have any events, other announcements you'd like to add, please include them in the chat uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to, to get to everyone. Um, I know that uh, George is adding a few items and we'll continue to add uh, items there. So uh, by all means, as you, if you have any events and, and things to add, please go ahead and, and put them in there. Uh, before we get to those advocacy announcements, I just wanted to, to say thank you to the DAG community. Um, I'm extremely pleased to announce that our annual fundraiser, Dig Deep for DAG, broke our $10,000 goal uh, by almost $2,000. So I'll I'll thank everyone for who contributed to us. You know, we're uh, it's a tough year. You know, a lot of our funding sources are are completely appropriately focused on on COVID relief. So those contributions go further than ever this year and certainly appreciate everyone who contributed and a special thank you to our honorary chair, John Gattuso and, and Gattuso Development Partners for, for their leadership and sponsorship uh, and just being a part of this program with us and, and helping us to make it so successful. Um, if you haven't had a chance to donate yet, uh, we certainly will still take your money. Uh, head to the DAG website and and find that support tab um, and, and send a few dollars our way. But thank you to everyone. Uh, it was a, a successful campaign and, and we very much appreciate it. Um, so with that, uh, I think let's get into some advocacy updates uh, with David Brownlee. Um, and please, if you have comments or things you want to share uh, that are going on in the city, please add them to the chat and, and I'll ask you to unmute after the advocacy update and, and, and share with us. Thanks, uh, David. Uh, Claire, would you just uh, would you share your the screen, please? Um, I just want to update you on on two issues that we talked about briefly last time. Um, I'm glad to report that on January first, uh, the governing council of the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, India, uh, which has the extraordinary campus designed by Lewis Kahn and built in the 1960s uh, and 1970s that they voted um, to withdraw the RFP that they had put out uh, for an architect to design the buildings that would replace Khan's wonderful flotilla of dormitories uh, that you see highlighted in yellow. Could I have the next slide, uh, Claire? Uh, this wonderful group of buildings of strong forms and memorable spaces is preserved for the moment uh, while the Indian Institute of Management um, says that we will deliberate on the feedback received, which included many messages from Philadelphia, uh, reevaluate um, uh, re the options and consult the best global conservation and structural experts and chart out a course of action. Um, of course, we don't know what that is. Um, everything sort of hangs in the balance. Um, and so I think it's certainly an, an issue that merits continued attention. Um, the, uh, the Getty Conservation Institute, ECOMOS, um, the World Monument Fund have all been involved in this, um, but, in, uh, but we do see some forward, forward motion there. Uh, could I have the next, please? Um, 
We also have talked about and have engaged in the last few weeks in the effort to protect the extraordinary group of 1860s and 1870s row houses uh, on Christian Street uh, in the area that was nicknamed Doctor's Row, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the neighborhood where many of Philadelphia's leading African-American citizens lived in the late 19th and early decades of the 20th century, including Julian Abel, uh, whose house is second from the right, uh, from the left in the slide on the left. Um, as I think most of you know, uh, the, uh, the house right next to Abel's at 1515 Christian Street is currently in the hands of a developer um, who has proposed to build uh, the condo building that you see diagrammatically represented on the right-hand side. I note that the row houses on either side don't match the ones that are actually there, but that's what they chose to put in the rendering. Um, uh, DAG has, uh, has issued a statement on this, which is uh, on our website noting that while this is legal, it's bad. Um, we support the Inquirer editorial board's call uh, for a moratorium on further demolitions, um, but we also call on the developer of this site to come up with a better solution, to preserve the facade uh, preferably, or build at least build something more in consonance with the surrounding buildings. Um, we have done that, our, I've heard from a number of sources uh, that the developer is being engaged in conversations about doing something better. Um, I should note that we have also called upon the developer uh, uh, who, current, who owns the Minton House on 12th Street, another site important in, American hist in, in African American history, to incorporate the facade of that building in the development of a, of a very tall uh, uh, residential tower on that site. Again, what the developer is proposing to do appears to be legal, uh, but that doesn't make it right. And in the meantime, we need to uh, redouble our efforts to identify and protect sites that are important for black history. Um, and and with, with respect to that, I want to call your attention to the fact that on January 27th at noon, the Preservation Alliance will be hosting a webinar called Preserving African-American Places based on a recent report issued by the, uh, by the National Trust. Uh, that's on the Preservation Alliance website, uh, a webinar on preserving African-American places on, June, on January 27th. Um, that's it on, the, develop, on the, uh, uh, the, the advocacy side. Thank you, David. Um, and, and hopefully uh, we can get that. Uh, Paul, I see Paul has, has added some comment uh, that the developers has shared a revised design with Councilman Johnson's office. Uh, better but still involves complete demolition so there's there's still conversation and work to be done there um and, and paul if you could share that that link to the the january 27th event in the chat as well that would be great um george claflin i know you had a, a couple things that you had shared in the chat uh, do you want to unmute and, and yes. walk through those a little bit yeah i'll be very very quick i put them in the chat uh, there's two public calls for uh, participation came out within the last week or so. The first one is to participate in evaluating the memorial to be built at the Bethel burying ground. That's the burying ground that was covered over by a recreation site and is now being uh, uncovered and uh, made into a more respectful uh, situation. Uh, so that's, that's being spearheaded by the uh, arts and culture office or the creative culture office and the web address for it is actually on there uh, in the chat. Uh, the second one is the refinery. Uh, the Clean Air Council has expressed concern that the refinery cleanup is being done too fast and too uh, in a shoddy way. Uh, and they're asking for public uh, participation in it. And uh, th this was the subject of an op-ed in the Inquirer uh, quite recently, and there's a uh, website for their re participation. The the consultant with, with the delightful name of Evergreen happens to be a subsidiary of Sunoco Oil Company. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting position for an environmental consultant to be in, but that's about it. So I hope please participate in either or both of those opportunities. Thank you, George. 
Um, I would like to next up uh, ask Tonetta Graham to, to join us. Uh, Tonetta is a, a past speaker uh, from Strawberry Mansion, uh, who is going to give us an update on the NCO uh, that, that is being worked on uh, for the Strawberry Mansion community. So Tonetta, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Thank you so much, you guys, for inviting me back. Happy New Year, first of all. Um, hopefully everyone is doing well. Um, so yeah, we've been getting in some good trouble here in Strawberry Mansion, um, trying to preserve um, our Victorian housing stock here in the neighborhood. So, you know, for decades, we knew that there was opportunities to have um, development because we had a high level of demolition in our community. Um, we know our, our houses are old, so it's, it's kind of getting rough for our residents to kind of keep them up. And I was here with you guys a couple months ago talking about um, our historic repair program and how we're working to try to help save and stabilize some houses for some home ownership, some long-term homeowners through our pilot program. And, and while we're in the midst of this, we're realizing that, you know, we had to tackle preservation on, on, on different levels. And, and one of the um, tools that we chose to exercise is an overlay, right? So we know that there's been a lot of uh, uh, development proposals going on in our community. We understand that just like that situation that uh, was uh, presented, David presented on Christian Street, we have a lot of that. And a lot of the residents um, are have holes in, in dug in the ground right next to them and don't have a clue as to what the building looks like, what it's gonna look like, you know, what uh, what it's gonna house, only the things that's listed or required to be posted by law. And that's the, the buy right option that folks have, 38 feet rooftop decks. And it seems like, you know, the developers have just settled with that, right? Um, and so we just felt as though uh, as a community, we wanted to preserve our variety of housing stock that we have, the Victorian houses, we have blocks of brownstones, we have um, uh, row houses, some some second uh, two stories, some three stories. Um, we have just blocks of that workman types housing that was built, and with all the same brick that we learned was made here in Philadelphia. Um, so we wanted to just make sure that the neighborhood continue to look like something that we recognize. And although we do know we have room for development, so it's not like an anti-development piece. We just wanted to make sure we had uh, opportunity to express our voice in our. Um, what, what our vision is for our neighborhood and some of these plans instead of being bowled over with the buy right option. So one of the options that communities have is an overlay. Now, we didn't know about it. We had to do a lot of education around it. So a, a, a bunch of community conscious residents, we, we formed a coalition. We had uh, block captains, uh, just longtime residents. We had RCOs, uh, CDC was part of it. The NAC was part of it. Um, all folks just got together and said, okay, hey, how can we help protect and preserve what we have here now? And, and while supporting this um, revitalization. And so we researched, um, we got in touch with our council president Clark's office. Um, we linked up with the planning commission because we, uh, and our planner, our, our, our uh, planner, David Fechtal, we had several meetings and they showed us some of the things that other neighborhoods did. And you know what we did? We wrote a bill. Yes, we wrote a bill. So this was community driven. We wrote a bill and we said, hey, we don't know if it's supposed to sound like this, but here you go, make it work. <laughs> and uh, fortunately we rallied together. Um, you know, some folks don't like it. You know, of course there's some pushback from the developers uh, trying to spread a narrative that it's an anti-development bill. But actually what it does, it, it just allows the community to kind of maintain control of some of the characteristics that we so love, right? While, um, while also being at the table and building those relationships so that we can design and it won't just look like something just been plopped, you know, or what we call it right fit, that right fit design. So yeah, and, and that's it in a nutshell. We got it passed. City Council has passed it unanimously. Um, I believe it's on the mayor's desk now. So, you know, we're working to see, you know, what happens next and what we need to do next. So we may need some advocacy ourselves. Um, and uh, real quick, I have uh, Miss Diane Davis is also part of the coalition. She may want to say a couple words, but I thank you guys for inviting us back. And, and I will continue to come back to update you on a couple things because we're, like I said, we're getting in good trouble here in Strawberry Mansion and preservation, preserving the neighborhood. Certainly appreciate that. Uh, Diane, do you want to, did you have any words to say before we continue? I don't think I could add anything other to what Tonetta has said, but um, as part of this coalition, I was extremely happy to be a part of saving our neighborhood because we also, as, as we've spoken before, the zoning commission, the planning, zoning board, planning commission, and city council. And the one thing that I've consistently said is as a longtime resident of Strawberry Mansion, I have a buy right also. 
So therefore, with that and, and the other neighbors and people who've grown up in a neighborhood, we want to be consistent. We, used, we had a village that looked like a village. So I am real happy to be a part of this. And as Tonetta said, that overlay was approved by city council. 17 to zero. So we're still working on it. We still have a long way to go, but we're working together as a unit. And we are so thankful for your group because uh, hopefully we can all work together and get this thing done because we're very proud of Shorey Mansion and we are extremely proud of our overlap. Well, I appreciate you coming back and, and giving us the update. I see Judith Robinson, some of our other friends from Strawberry Mansion are on here. Appreciate you coming back and checking in with us. I know David Fecto is on the call as well. So Thank you for, for your work over uh, uh, over the Planning Commission. Um, and DAG is in the process of drafting a letter of support for Strawberry Mansion and for the process of, of neighbors getting involved in, in the development of their community. So um, look for that on, on our website later this week. So that that is in, in the works. So thank you for the update, certainly appreciate it. And, uh, and we, will, we will follow up and, and, and don't be a stranger. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All righty. Talk to you soon. So um, I would like to pass it now uh, as we start to look at uh, uh, what upcoming events over to Marsha Moss to, to let us know what's on, on the agenda for next month. Marsha? Okay. Uh, thanks, Eli. Well, we're happy to announce that uh, Tia Wynn will be speaking at our next meeting, which will be on Wednesday, February 24th at 10 a.m. And as the new director of the Community Design Collaborative, uh, Tia will be sharing her expanded vision for the organization, which includes a, a deep commitment uh, to using de design to take on social justice uh, issues. So please uh, mark your calendar and uh, join us. Eli? Thank you. I appreciate the update. Looking forward to that, uh, to that update or, or to that, uh, that program. So last bits of business before we move, uh, we move into our speaker. Um, a few things to, to check out on the DAG website uh, and, and things that we are posting. Uh, the DAG Dispatch is, is a new feature we've been putting out uh, every Monday morning. It's a bit of a catch up on, on the week's uh, development, preservation, planning, architecture news around the city. Uh, so it's, it's a good primer to get you ready for, for your week. So you can check that out on our social media and on our website. Um, also, we're continuing to grow the forum section of our website. We have some great pieces on there from Emily Smith, the executive director of uh, the Magic Gardens, uh, writing about the, the Painted Bride uh, and the ongoing work there. Uh, Faye Anderson, a, a DAG steering committee member, wrote a wonderful piece about the historic Henry Minton House. Um, so if you want to write a piece, if, if you have an opinion, something you'd like to share with us, uh, please get in touch through the website. Uh, you can contact David Brownlee or you can contact dagfellow at gmail.com. Um, that's a, a great way to get involved and, and we welcome those public opinions to, to share through the forum. So uh, with that, uh, let's, get into, uh, let's get into our program. Um, it's a real exciting program and, and I'm glad to have uh, Ashley Hahn with us. Ashley is a writer and researcher working at the intersection of public life, public space, and public history. Uh, she's the former managing editor of Plan Philly uh, and serves as the volunteer organizer for Jane's Walk in Philadelphia, which is a global festival of public walks celebrating the legacy of Jane Jacobs. Um, she holds master's degrees in historic preservation and city planning uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and in 2019, she won that Adele Chatfield Taylor Rome Prize in historic preservation from the American Academy in, in Rome. So I will turn it over to Ashley. We will have a QA and a at the end. So please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll, we'll do our best to get to them all. Um, but with that, I'm excited to, to welcome Ashley and, and thank you for, for being here. Thank you, Eli. And thank you all you daggers for inviting me here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak this morning among so many friends. Um, I'm a little bit sad that we're not doing this in person at the Center for Architecture, but maybe this virtual gathering will help us think about what it means to be together. The ties that bind, the ideas, the places, the experiences that make us feel whole. Because that's kind of the red thread that I find running through my work and that I wanna talk about today. Um, I'll share my screen.
and jump into a presentation here. Um, it's been a minute since we've all seen each other. If you're familiar with my work, you might recall that I write about public space and historic preservation a lot. No surprise, I am still on that jag. I have been working on a project about preserving the life between buildings, about historic public spaces and the practices of public life that animate and give them meaning. It is basically a search for expansive, holistic, and hopefully more honest approaches to the public realm in old cities. Though I didn't recognize it at the time, my work on this project really stems from a 2018 series I wrote for Plan Philly about public space projects happening in Philadelphia. And I'll talk more about some takeaways from those today. I was able to begin more serious research and writing on this topic thanks to the Rome Prize uh, that I won last year or two years ago. <laughs> um, that extraordinary experience is ostensibly why I was invited here today. What'd you do with your Rome Prize, Ashley? <laughs> Fran frankly, a lot. <laughs> uh, there was a lot learned. Um, suffice it to say that time away is clarifying. And journalists rarely have the luxury of time to revisit and reflect on their work, much less grow something new from it. So it was a tremendous gift. This is me in Rome, blissfully unaware of what 2020 held. And I could spend this morning taking you on a virtual jaunt through my favorite piazza. I will spare you the pain of wanderlust. Instead, I wanna use most of this time to talk about some ideas about preservation in the public realm. Using places that you'll be familiar with locally and looking at them through the lens of what DAG might want to refer to as design equity. We're gonna skate through some interesting ideas, intersecting and interesting ideas about democracy, time and public space in the course of exploring why repairing and caring for our civic infrastructures, that is the spaces communities share and the public life they support, why those should be an overt preservation concern and what exactly is at stake. This is very much a work in progress and these ideas remain fragmentary. Their frayed edges might not fit together neatly yet but you're getting a live look into a piece of a manifesto in progress. So thank you in advance for the indulgence. I will likely raise more questions than I answer. And I hope you will excuse the soul searching contained here. Maybe you'll even do a little yourself. It's a new year. And I don't need to tell you how extraordinarily challenging time these times are. I'm trying to meet this moment with a little reflection and I hope a little grounding too. I hope it encourages us all to think more about what motivates our work at this point. So with that, why are we here? Broadly speaking, I am here because I'm interested in the messy work of democracy, what it means to build a more perfect union. How does that happen? In what moments, in what spaces? Saying those words aloud now, as we're still learning the details of an attempted coup last week and while who knows what major news is breaking, I realize I risk sounding very Pollyanna-ish. But isn't that the question lurking in the back of your mind too? What can I do to change my corner of the world? To mend all of the broken things around us, the ones that threaten to swallow us whole? How on earth do we rebuild from all of this? Does my design work even matter? <clears throat> well, allow me to backbend a little bit into politi political philosophy just briefly, because I think it's important to remember that the very idea of public space originates from the earliest concepts of democracy. And it is explicitly woven into the American version, such as it is. Let's allow ourselves to wonder then what precisely might the pursuit of happiness look like for a city and its people. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson changes John Locke's life, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In doing so, he's partly borrowing an idea from Aristotle about civic virtue, that is, what it means to be good citizens and good leaders with a robust public life. For Aristotle, the ultimate goal for an individual and the city are the same, happiness, 
He argues, happiness is an activity and a complete utilization of virtue. This isn't a happiness that is flip or lightweight. It's a deep fulfillment of purpose. It's about being just. For individuals, it's realized through meaningful participation in civic life. That means cities too can be agents of happiness. I want us to remember that public space and our right to it is written into our founding. We can find it in the constitution. It took a walk with Jan Gale on Market Street a few years back to remind me of this, but there it is right next to freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The first amendment secures the right of people to peaceably assemble. The ability to see these freedoms manifest in physical space is among the highest callings for anyone designing cities or shaping the public realm. Public life is one barometer for the health of our democracy. So it matters greatly how we construct public space. If the howling challenge for our time is advancing a more just version of American democracy out of the ashes of whatever is left, the urgent question for all of us is this, how do we create spaces that support a healthy, democratic, rich public life for all? We have so much work to do. I do not for one second pretend to have all the answers here, but I think the challenge is clear and that some of the solutions begin at home. For me, answering this question requires facing the shortcomings of our public realm with clear eyes. And specifically, I think we need solutions that embrace social memory and cultural heritage as public goods that are instrumental to building a meaningful, just public realm. One where a broader spectrum of our stories are accurately reflected and old oppressions are not further enshrined. Okay, so let's climb down from the stars and have a look around at street level. These days, I have to remind myself how optimistic the last decade has been for Philadelphia and cities like it. Remember what it was like to see Philly tackling big, overdue, important things? A new zoning code, comp plans, district plans, riverfront revitalizations on two rivers, reversing population decline. We have been doing big stuff. Good job, everyone. Happily, that era of growth included a public space renaissance that I trust we've all enjoyed. The success of public space investments in and around Center City awakened our collective appetite and unlocked major philanthropic and public investment, enabling more projects, more equitably distributed and networked citywide. Say what you will about what's become of Rebuild, but it was born with the ambition to make a once in a generation reinvestment in parks, rec centers and libraries with the hope that public spaces can reconnect residents to the city and to one another. It helps that city leaders like ribbon cuttings and ceremonial shovels, but many of them have also bought into the vision that public space investment can be a catalyst to boost civic engagement, public health, socioeconomic mixing, public safety, property values, and environmental sustainability. There is a lot of hope pinned on these projects. So public spaces are not simply nice to have, the stakes are high for our collective well being. And I want to zoom in quickly on why that matters. We know that American life has become increasingly atomized and that our political, our political life is dangerously fragmented. We see evidence of it daily, but these conditions have been brewing for a long time and they are expressed spatially. In the last generation, we've come apart. Here's a little of what's become of us. Some 40% of people say most people can be trusted. That's down from more than half in 1970. 20% of people in America report spending frequent time with neighbors. That's down from 30% in 1970. We spend double the amount of time watching TV than we did 30 years ago. 85% of people drive to work when we did that sort of thing. That's up from 20% from a year, uh, from a generation ago and just 5% of people commute via public transit. Although there's been a back to the city movement, we have never had less in common with each other. These divisions are even more stark at the extremes of income. Wealthier people, of course, have the privilege of choosing to live separate lives than the rest of us. It is the difference between buying a book on Amazon or going to the library, belonging to a gym instead of going to the rec center, choosing private schools instead of a neighborhood public school. When we have fewer opportunities to encounter people different than ourselves by riding the bus or sitting on a bench in the park, we build less empathy. 
There's also plenty of research that contact with strangers actually makes us happier too. All of this conspires to further accentuate what's dividing us. Of course, the pandemic has made these differences even more extreme, placing extraordinary pressure on the public realm to perform in new ways. This week, Parks and Rec reported that park use was up 50% in 2020. That's amazing, except that most places weren't designed to support that kind of load. Going forward, how can cities more intentionally cultivate the kinds of public spaces that bring us together, where strangers might become neighbors? How can these spaces help us weave together a more durable social fabric? The pointed question for older cities like ours goes beyond the need to strive for inclusive and inviting spaces. We need to design with time in mind too. People are paying renewed attention to the histories our public realm expresses and are demanding more accurate, accurate and equitable representation. If our charge is to dismantle and reconstruct the city systems that perpetuate old hierarchies, we must become keenly attuned to the inequities represented in the public realm. Whose histories do our public spaces elevate or ignore? How are they maintained and for whose benefit do they change? I started thinking more about these questions in 2018 when I was working on a long form series called In Common. Each piece was a deep dive into projects and processes reshaping a piece of Philly's public landscape. Hi, Janetta. <laughs> Uh, I embedded in several projects and tried to tell stories about this work, warts and all, from civic engagements to ribbon cutting. I tried to consider who had a seat at the table, whose narratives got elevated, what uses mattered, the prospect of green investment driving gentrification, issues of design equity, the power and reach of community voice, and the potential effects on neighborhood life. As an old city, constructing new public space from a blank slate is rare. The majority of public spaces in recent years have involved bringing new life to old infrastructure. In the parlance of preservation, they're adaptive reuse projects, though no one really talks about them that way. And the preservation community almost wholly passed on the opportunity for deeper engagement at each one of these. Let's consider a few examples. Here we see the rail park where a disused rail line becomes a linear park through a neighborhood having an identity crisis as it rapidly changes. How does phase one honor its past? Cloud Geshen designed a beautiful 80 foot long Corten steel story map interpreting the, the neighborhood's industrial history. It serves to orient visitors to what they're walking on. But so far that's where any engagement with the physical history or grappling with the neighborhood's more complex narratives in public has ended. It's beautiful and it functions to buffer park goers from the server farm's fans next door, but it is history as decoration. In East Park, an out of commission city reservoir was transformed into the Discovery Center. Here we see the beautiful lake. It's an outdoor educational facility joined, jointly operated by Outward Bound and Audubon PA. It's a major investment that provides access to nature and classes aiming to draw visitors of all ages from the city and region. It is serene and beautiful. Generations of Strawberry Mansion residents have already had deep connections to this place. In the many years of planning and fundraising for this project, the organizations behind it never totally embraced those relationships or cultivated meaningful ways of working with them. Yes, stories were told, memories shared. They were even put in an exhibit, though it registered as a bit of an afterthought when the Discovery Center opened. It was a missed opportunity to make this project sing by building from those attachments and using them as a guide. Which brings me to love. This one I spent years with. While the old love park did have flaws for sure, it did one thing well, it was for everyone. As the park redesign was being planned, the preservation community rallied behind one thing, save the saucer. Happily, it was spared. Good job. The civic engagement team from Penn Praxis collected a lot of information about how people used Love Park and their hopes for it. It was useful, but no one bothered organizing around what made this place actually meaningful to so many people. What ended up lost in translation were the vital layers of meaning derived from a diversity of everyday use. When it reopened, I think people couldn't even see the new park through a sense of loss and disorientation. 
I defended the project and I enjoy watching Philadelphians find new ways to use it to rally or relax there. But how rough to see a place with so much personality become basic. Fortunately, love is still evolving. I wanna be clear here. Each one of these projects and others like them are hard won miracles. They express faith in a brighter future for Philadelphia. My hat goes off to everyone who works so hard to make them happen. That said, we should be looking for lessons in them about what to do differently going forward, particularly to ensure that the public realm here feels authentically ours. My fear is this. I worry they contain a kind of distant echo contain a distant echo of urban renewal. In the end, so much placemaking is still done by the victor and it risks flattening what it makes, what it means to make really interesting itself to the point of becoming unrecognizable to ourselves. Public space is a mirror. So we must ask if our spaces show us who we are and how they express our values. Do they reinforce old inequities? Are they honest about what they've witnessed? How well do they support free expression or convey aspects of civic memory? A lot of public space projects end up smoothing out the kinks and quirks, sanding down rough elements to something safer. The life that they encourage often revolves around consumption. Programming is energetically geared at keeping spaces busy, lest something worse fill the void. The design vocabulary of lighter, quicker, cheaper features like colorful movable furniture and lush planters have become all too familiar. And it's becoming flat as an Edison light bulb in any sleek coffee shop in any gentrifying neighborhood and is signifying. It is prepackaged, plug and play urbanism fit for any town USA. These recognizable and repetitious elements do help coax people outside. So it serves a purpose, particularly for those who may not have the habit of living in public people for whom public amenities are an alternative to an otherwise privatized life. Someone choosing between parks on tap or meeting friends at a bar or whose gym closed in the pandemic so they're doing CrossFit at the neighborhood basketball court or going for a run on the river. On occasions when designers do make some use of the past, it's often treated like a decorative knickknack, disconnected from deeper roots and dissonant in meaning, like a specimen object from another realm. So where am I hopeful? There's still so much work to do. That's a good thing. And there is plenty of interesting work that's going on too. I'm interested in seeing more projects like Hatfield House, which flung open the doors to an historic house in Fairmount Park fun and funded a group of social practice artists to embed and collaborate with neighbors. It's an interesting example of what's possible at a public site that has been functionally lost with a little money and a desire to share power. Who knows what that work has seeded. Over on the Delaware River, it's easy to see the old Penn's Landing as a poor public space, the consequence of a political boondoggle. But that didn't stop people from building deep relationships to it over time, particularly through live music. And that helped buoy the early success of Spruce Street Harbor Park, drawing people from all over the city. Now that it's being overhauled, I think there's a very meaningful opportunity to build a future Penn's Landing in a way that draws from all of those relationships. Otherwise, we risk fixing an aspect of the place that not, might not be entirely broken. And then there's Monument Lab, the Philly-based public art and history practice focused on studying public monuments. We've watched its collaborative approach learn from Philly and keep growing. Now, with big money from the Mellon Foundation to conduct a nationwide monument survey, I hope they'll bring home new lessons and test ideas here to help inform how we can think about our monuments, seeking ways to amend our landscape of memory so it can be more just and reflective. Most of all, I'm hopeful that people who care deeply about the city's history, preservationists by profession or by other means, will start to see fit to participate more directly and progressively with public space work. It's time to use the processes remaking our public landscape to excavate layers of meaning, honor diverse community histories and build new connections with the past. When I interview Philadelphians, I often ask about their favorite places. It can be a kind of icebreaker when we're talking about a neighborhood or their work. Almost everyone answers me with some kind of a public space, often a neighborhood park. Places like the Wissahickon, 
Rittenhouse Square, Clark Park, Reading Terminal Market are also frequent mentions. These are among the places we're most attached to. Preservationists are uniquely equipped to help parse the kind of attachments to place that are touchstones of belonging and identity. Their diverse interdisciplinary skills as oral historians, documentarians, and interpreters and facilitators of public dialogue could help enrich so many public space projects. Preservation makes legible layers of history, helping to ground us in place and time. In the words of the preamble of the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act, the historical and cultural foundations of the nation should be preserved as a living part of our community life and development in order to give a sense of orientation to the American people. That sense of orientation, that's the past alive. That's the past as a compass. At its best, historic preservation is a process by which we may repurpose the inherited past to build a more equitable and just future. The public realm is an incredibly potent area for doing this work. Unfortunately, the preservation field tends not to focus on it and it leaves public life wholly underexplored. But the public realm is a witness, inscribed with a continuous narrative that is as shared as it is contested. New public space projects in a city as old as Philadelphia should be seen as occasions for powerful truth-telling works of public history. Answering that call honestly requires our collective forbearance and heart. This is not a kind of preservation that treats the city as untouchable as mummified or museumified, but as an active living thing. It is not about arresting change, but making the past useful so we can better understand each other through what we have in common. This kind of preservation is a whole lot less about regulation and more about dynamic process. And happily, it is not the work of professionals alone. Productively grappling with big thorny questions about heritage, memory, and identity in public will require our collective efforts and imaginations. If the pandemic is a pause that ushers in an era of austerity where there won't be a ton of money for fancy capital projects, it is a good time to start planning how we will rebuild differently. Despite this pause, of course, people are in the street demanding a more just world. Our public spaces are being very heavily used, and they are a welcome salve in a world locked down. We can choose to make use of this time to create space for difficult conversations. I think more expansive forms of public space work that more actively wrestle with dimensions of time and memory will give weight to citizen expertise, enable professionals to share their skills, and maybe help build more trust. By building common cause, it might also help diminish the reputation of design and preservation work as elite. Our job now is to find more ways of working together, motivated by empathy, by some notion of beloved community, to make sure that as we change our, as we change our cities, we do so in ways that reinforce justice and support a vibrant democratic public life, edging us hopefully closer to that old high-minded idea about happiness. Access to a fulfilling public life is part of our right to the city and it is tied to our well being. It requires a public realm that more accurately reflects history and ourselves. This might not solve our biggest problems that are bedeviling this country, but I do think it's a step toward mending our frayed social fabric. The more collaboratively we produce public space, the more I see the potential for values beyond those of the market to be elevated, making room for different ways of sharing life in a city to emerge. The more capably our historic public spaces reflect our complexities, the more I think we will be able to build forms of public power that help us envision alternatives to the soulless, neoliberal, winner-takes-all city building around us. In cultivating a more honest, living relationship with the past in public, I believe we might find the necessary and literal common ground to help build a more just urban future. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate, uh, appreciate having you here and, and giving that presentation. I, I wanna open the floor up uh, and get some questions for you to chew on. And I think a, a good meaty one to start with is, is Kathy Dowdell's. Uh, so, so is it the preservationists don't embrace public spaces or that urban designers and others don't embrace preservation? Great question, Kathy, it's both. That sounds like a cheater answer, but I don't think, um, I don't think people that are generally engaged in 
in the sort of urban design of, of public space do a terribly good job of dealing with history most of the time and preservationists are simply too jammed up in this city in particular with developer driven demolition and a backlog of buildings that are left unprotected to kind of dive in. But I think it is our job. Fair, so in your opinion, what frameworks uh, truly, uh, what, what frameworks to truly have community driven preservation? what frame works I'm, I'm i'm reading this question it says what frameworks work so <laughs> what frameworks work to truly have community driven preservation well i think there are some interesting examples that um open the that begin uh, the begin um that maybe they borrow <laughs> to, to borrow from the world of public space start with an iterative model that open up um, opportunities to share stories, to learn from each other, and to share power in how we use and create space together. From there, I think you can use that as, as the fertile soil from which to, to grow new approaches, and they can be more tailored to the spaces themselves mm -hmm. and the communities who find them so valuable. So I don't, think there's a, I don't think there's a specific model here that works, but I think it requires us to be a little bit more um, open-minded about how to design in, in the fourth dimension. So then I guess the follow-up question uh, from that was, how do we make participation not only intentional, but impactful? Great question. You have to share power. You have to surrender a little bit. Um, and that's not to say that we should give in to design by committee, but it, it is to say, you know, it's not about inviting neighbors to the table. It is about, you know, building the table together. So uh, Dave, David Brownlee, uh, perhaps a little tongue in cheekly says, do Americans not make use of public space as actively as say Italians? Uh, is that part of the problem, you know, from your experience uh, traveling around a bit? Uh, David, what a generous how, how question. Can that, how can well, that I shed think, some light? Yeah, there's a cultural issue here. We have to, we are having to be spoon fed and coaxed back outdoors together. We have not had the culture of um, public life everywhere, certainly that say Mediterranean uh, cultures do. And I think, you know, the, the, the challenge in many of those places are that public life, forms of public life are being displaced by things like hyper tourism, um, a heavy security presence and, and uh, um, uh, the kind of public spaces are be becoming overwhelmed in a different way. Um, but it is, yeah, it's a, it's a cultural thing. And, and I think um, that's not to say that, that like the Italians have it perfect either. <laughs> they have their own challenges. Um, they're rich in, public spaces may be rich in history, but there is you know, often diminishing amenity for the citizen, for the resident. So as you talk a little bit about your, your travels and your, your work, What's next? What's your next piece in, in this fight, in this, in this work? Uh, what, what, what's your future holding right now? Oh, mercy. I wish I had a good answer for that. I'm afraid um, so many things have been on hold. I, I want to continue working on this project. I hope it can develop into a series of essays that maybe form a kind of book. We'll see. We'll see if I can make, make that happen. Um, but it is very much uh, where my heart is. So I want to keep working on that. and. Um, and hopefully be opened up to, uh, to doing more work soon. Um, I've been a little bit shut down. <laughs> so great, great question here from Bob Ravelli. Uh, how do we address the trend towards privatized public space and giving the management of public spaces to outside groups? It's really dangerous, I think. I mean, I understand the impulse. Um, it's very, you know, cities are strapped and it's very hard to not only make the necessary investments to upgrade some older public spaces, but um, maintenance is, is a cost that is not always baked into the plan. So I'm, I'm frankly kind of concerned that the, we're going even more in that direction at this point. Um, I think, uh, you know, you, you, the project for public spaces, for example, has pivoted to figuring out how to make partnerships you know, the centerpiece of their public space work. I think partnerships are great, but it doesn't help um, when, you're not, when you're not also building from a place that is, is uh, more ground up. 
So yeah, I think this is this is a, a, has been a great a great risk. Obviously, there are there are upsides to it too. It has meant you know new investment and and upkeep and safety, and we want those things, but they come at a price. So, David Feldman asks, uh, how can neighborhood wide public facing actions like historic overlays uh, function to make streets and neighborhoods character defining public spaces versus single space public spaces like parks. Yeah, I think it's really important to think about this as a network and the kinds of public spaces are not only parks and plazas, but sidewalks and, um, you know, the, the, yeah, certainly streets. I mean, it's important that when you start thinking about the overlays, you do start including those as character defining features. I want us to start thinking about um, the public realm as, as a living piece of our past, it is it is a, it is a legacy that we are, we inherit and and have to make use of. And I hope that as as more neighborhoods are thinking holistically about um, their neighborhood character, I'm super psyched to see that Strawberry Mansion has, you know, had these wins. Um, I hope that this is part of that conversation too. So, Stephen Peitzman brings up. The fact that it is winter. Uh, so, what about indoor public spaces? What went so wrong with the Kimmel Center? Um, oh, that jumped on me. Uh, how would uh, historical awareness have helped? Um, are there some recent good models of creating indoor public spaces? Yeah, I mean, there are certainly winter cities um, across the world, and I don't think indoor is really the only way to go about it. We have to think. Um, a little bit more nimbly about the kinds of activities that work in cold places. You look at Toronto building like a skating loop under an elevated highway, and like that's that's deliberate winter winter work. Um, part of the dream for um, the Centennial Commons site is uh, over in in West Park is is a, a path that would become a flooded skating loop. I have no idea if that's still on the books, but but we're trying to do things like that. As for indoor spaces, um, oh, what went so wrong at the Kimmel Center? I think it's it's a scale thing mostly, but the and and the relationship to the street, um, yeah, I don't really want to touch that one. But think instead about you know why a place like Reading Terminal works. It's fine grained. It's intimate. It's um, rich and diverse. I think um, we don't tend to see indoor space as as communal space. We don't we don't intentionally build much of it. I can't really think of very many examples here that um, would lend themselves to to that. Um, I may be blanking, but yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not sure that um, I guess my answer is Focus on making outside more comfortable <laughs> and get a good coat. So, I like that. I like that as an answer. So jumping back a little bit on the on the sidewalks and public spaces rather than than you know the the large public space. Uh, Jim Duffin says, are are things like driveways on sidewalks for new row houses an intrusion on public space? Should the city think about that issue from a public space perspective? Jim, that's a gorgeous softball. Yeah, of course. Um, we we yeah, of course they are. Um, they are they are driveways to new row houses are a diminishment of the public realm. Yes, full stop. We so, should uh, and we, we should approach it from we should approach that argument that way as well. Um, we don't tend to to think about even though we may feel a sense of ownership on our block or something, I don't think we tend to think about the sidewalk as our, you know, as a, as a networked space that is, that is profoundly shared. Um, I, think you, I think it would help to remind some people of that every now and again. So going back to a conversation about engagement, um, you know, there's a trend towards in, engagement consultants. Um, you know, how do you feel about that, you know, George, George Claflin's asking why not educate and support the designers to participate more directly? Ideally, these projects with engagement consultants are helping to educate those designers, I hope. Um, that's part of the, the learning process. Um, but yeah, I've seen those at work. I don't know that they always work well, but I do think, you know, 
um, it's, it's difficult to expect that, you know, this stuff is taught in school and, and reinforced through repetition in, in the workplace. I think, you know, some of that is happening now, but we do, we do need to ask the design community to bone up on, on those skills. I think they're really important. And I think they only serve to make a project richer and to open people's minds to, um, to possibilities that they otherwise might not be um, considering for a project. I think it, it's only to the good. Um, so yeah, if there are, if there are ways to develop, um, you know, continued education around that, I think that'd be really, really helpful. So uh, Maria McGettigan brings up the woodlands uh, in West mm. Philadelphia as, as an example of private space that has opened itself up to the public through an array of programs and events, including a dedication to historic preservation of its buildings and grounds. Um, can you talk about your, your thoughts on the woodlands, what they do there, how they've been, how they've been doing uh, as an example that others can potentially uh, use? I think the Woodlands is an incredible example of this. I've really admired um, what the very small staff there has been able to build. Um, the advantage that they have, the secret advantage that they have is that they're private. They get to do things that, is, that are much harder for other kinds of spaces to do. They can have bonfires, uh, you know, back to winter. They can ha put out fire pits and, you know, have s'mores or storytelling or stargazing nights in a way that doesn't require a permit from Parks and Rec, they can just do it. So the Woodlands does have some advantages there, but I think part of what they've, what they've been able to successfully do is, is be more open, see what works, open to, open to some new partnerships and to really start seeing that place as a public asset because people were using it that way. Um, but to see that as, as a, you know, as what, as a strength, I think, they are, it's not easy to invite the public into his, a really historic space that has some fragility. You know, don't learn to drive at the woodlands, please. <laughs> um, you know, it's it is hard to to hold those two things, and I think they have they're they're trying to be patient with it. A nice a nice example of that is the is the um, grave gardeners. So inviting people to to actually tend the space, put their hands on it create a set, cultivate a sense of participation um, that builds new connections. It's a beautiful asset. So as, as we move more and more towards outdoor dining as just this, this way of life that we are now part of, um, you know, last month uh, we highlighted some of the, the less good examples of, of outdoor dining, but how do we keep it going? You know, this this reclamation of of public of public space and, and this this sort of new old use uh, of our sidewalks uh, and, and streets. How do we? Where does the history come in? How do we keep that going? Well, I'm not entirely sure where the history would come in, but I do think. Um, isn't it interesting to see what we can do in terms of permitting when push comes to shove? The speed at which the Corona shacks jumped outside and blocks started being closed was impressive. And I think it's a signal that the city is actually more nimble than maybe it gives, it, it gives itself permission to be sometimes. So for people who are interested in, in extending that and, and uh, ex you know hoping that that long outlives our pandemic life, um, I certainly am. I, I think, you know, helping to make that experience um, feel good, helping to recognize that the, how much space we actually give over to cars. Like when you look at the blocks closed off to traffic in Old City or next to Rittenhouse that, that have restaurants in the street, basically, when you recognize how many people can enjoy that space instead of letting cars pass or prioritizing the all important bus, which Please get around where, how you need to be, but I think I think these um, I think these are built to stay, and I think we should take a lesson away from it in um, in permitting. We can do good things. We can try things. They don't have to work. They don't have to be perfect. They can be janky to start out, and and uh, we should get, have have a more permissive approach to those attempts. Well, Ashley, I, I appreciate you taking these questions and, and spending uh, spending your Thursday morning with us today. 
Um, so I, I think with that, we can let you off the hook with all these questions and, and folks, uh, if we can give a round of applause uh, as, as we wrap up for the month. Yeah, thank you everyone for listening. I appreciate the time today and uh, it's really nice to see all of you. So I have put in a couple uh, items, the, the Bethel burying ground that George spoke of. Um, my wife's an archeologist. I've been following that process uh, closely and it's a very cool program. So click on that, uh, check that out a bit. Uh, there's the refinery cleanup. Um, and then um, Patrick shared with us the uh, preserving African-American places with the National Trust. So those links I just put back in the chat. So take a look at those. Um, we'll be back here. Uh, Feb uh, Wednesday, February 24th at 10 uh, with Taya Wynn. She's going to tell us all about her plans for CDC. Um, and with that, uh, thank you again, Ashley. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.